Okay, got it on. <clears throat> okay, welcome back everyone to our second lecture on BC310 Church and Ministry Administration. Today we are talking about church staff management, uh, managing church staff and so on. Um, let me just see here, there's a comment there from Roshan. Uh, pastor problems will arise in the office. Uh, it is okay to be angry if things are not done properly. Only thing we should not hurt others um, with our behavior. Be angry and sin not hope I'm right. Um, the, the fact is, yes, Roshan, we all get angry. I mean, we're just human beings and that getting angry is part of our, you know, our emotional response to uh, certain situations. Yeah, we do get angry. But like the scripture says, you know, be angry, but don't sin. Don't do something that's wrong uh, out of anger. And that's where we have to be careful. Right? Don't hurt others. Don't explode and say and do things that are not right. Okay, any other questions, any other comments before we continue forward? So what we've looked at is um, the hiring process, right? So the first thing, what I guess what I'm trying to emphasize is uh, in, in managing church staff, the first thing is you hire right, get the right people in. If we can do that, we can actually avoid a, a lot of problems. And so I was just giving you some things that, you know, uh, kind of we do here, mostly I do here when I'm, when I'm interviewing people. These are kind of things I look for uh, and so on. Okay. Then some other things that we also do, which, which are common things, is uh, uh, we uh, uh, we look we do background checks. Uh, now these days we check social media. So uh, one of the things that HR person will do is check their social media activity. You know, is there anything any in any kind of things that are not right? Then uh, we will flag it. You know, uh, because we are a Christian organization, if this person is going to be working for us, but if they're doing stuff on social media that's bad, dangerous, whatever, you know, it, it will eventually reflect back on the organization. So we do those kinds of checks as well. Um, we also speak to, you know, depending on the, the role they say, speak to their previous references. Usually it'll be a pastoral reference we check, ask about how they've done so. So assuming all of that is done, everything is fine, then of course we give an offer letter. So this offer letter is also very important. Uh, that means in the offer letter, and I think, um, yeah, I'll have to give you a sample of it. I'll, I'll put up a sample offer letter. Basically it tells you, you're gonna start on this date, this is going to be your role, this is what you're going to be uh, paid, and this is whom you will report to. And then along with the offer letter is the role, same role description and our staff guidelines. So this is a formal welcome to this person. Right? We send offer letter. Now this offer letter is very important because the offer letter, the role description staff is basically saying, look, we are getting you on board and this is what you're expected to do. So again, that's very important. Right? And now uh, for, a, for a new role, especially for people who are like straight out of college, in case we're hiring somebody like that, um, then we give, usually have a, 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 a probation period of three months. So if there's a new role, then we tell them, okay, three months, you're on probation. That means you're going, before we can make you a permanent staff, we're going to watch how you do for three months. So that's, that we do that in some cases when they're, especially when they're, fresh out of college but usually experienced people we don't do that because they all you know they already know how to work in organizations so on and we give them all our staff guidelines sample of that is available and then once the uh, person starts usually on the first day there's a lot of uh, you know uh, orientation kind of thing uh, our hr person will get them to take care of the paperwork which is you know, they give their bank accounts any other paperwork that we need uh, we get them set up with the computer systems, what all of those kinds of things. Uh, just a little bit of orientation, you know, how do they fill up their timesheets? How do they report? How do they do this, that, all the other? The HR person walks them through all of that so they kind of get settled in. Usually it's a one day thing, uh, it's done. Okay, so we bring them on. Now, the next thing. Uh, important thing, of course, in any Christian organization is uh, paying the people, 
right? So uh, uh, this is important. This is important because people shouldn't feel that, hey, just because I'm working for a church or a ministry, uh, uh, I won't get paid well. You know, no, that shouldn't be the case. Now, of course, we may not be paying as high as a, as corporates who are making a lot of profits um, and so on, but at least we should be pay well. That means their needs should be taken care of. They should have enough money to save and take care of their family, all of those kinds of things, right? So, um, so the uh, the the organization, as part of taking care of your staff or uh, mainly staff I'm talking about, is that we need to pay them well, right? So here's how we do it. And, uh, you know, some of you may be familiar with these things, so forgive me if you're already familiar with these things, but I'll just share it. So the compensation, which is the what the person receives, there's a salary, a base salary, which they are paid every month. That's their salary, and that will be based upon their role and their experience and the responsibility they're carrying and so on. So you have a base salary. Plus, there is a bonus. Now, you may we give a bonus once a year. That's usually at the beginning of December for all of our full-time staff. Uh, some organizations may break it down and give it twice a year or whatever. But there's some benefit of being part of the, and we have a calculation how we do bonus uh, we can't do it as corporates do but we do have a system here and then there are other benefits and we will talk about that you know so for example all our staff get uh, health insurance them and their immediate family that is their spouse and children are covered with health insurance um, they get um, uh, what we call as um, pension uh, deposits into their pension or their here, here in India, it's called Provident Pension Fund. So they get a certain amount given by the organization that goes into their uh, retirement fund. Um, then we also have uh, paid leaves and so on. And then we have other benefits that we give to our staff, like, you know, say 10,000 rupees every year for their own education, anything they want to spend on in terms of learning related to their work, anything they can, you know, if they don't want to do online course or whatever, they can use that. Uh, they are they have free access to our Bible college. They can attend Bible college classes if they want to. They can attend weekend schools if they want to uh, as part of their work hours. So 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 it's, it's a benefit. So if even if you attend Bible college, you know, up to four hours, it's considered as part of your work. Or if you attend a weekend school. Full day, eight hours, it's part of your book. So those are different benefits that we have identified, which we can give to our staff. And then we have uh, ministry-related leaves. So if they want to go and do some ministry on their own, uh, we have a certain number of days in a year that they can go and do that. This is outside of their regular vacation leave and all of those things. So these are all benefits that we give to our staff. So that gives them their total compensation, right? So why is compensation important? Because this is this affects how they feel about the job and the organization. You know, and this is a big motivation. Right? We want to keep our people motivated. We want to keep them happy, um, and uh, we want to make them feel that they are cared for. Uh, they should be worrying about money. Uh, they should be free of that worry, so that they can, you know, uh, uh, put their mind on doing the work of the ministry. So, uh, so that's why salary or compensation that we give is important, right? Now, and uh, also, uh, they also need to feel that it is fair, uh, it is being done fairly, that is nobody's given money preferentially or anything like that. No, everything everything is fair. They also need to understand that it is linked to their performance and also how the organization does. So there's an overall responsibility. They are responsible to the organization. They're also responsible for the well-being of the organization. That means the organization does well, everybody's fine. But if the organization doesn't do well, then it's going to impact everybody. Right? 
So uh, for these reasons, for how they feel about the job, that they're feeling they're treated fairly, and also there's a sense of responsibility, compensation is important. Now, of course, you know how much an organization can pay will depend on where the organization is financially. Uh, you know, so I, 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 I understand that there is, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, a, 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 a dependency there that uh, if the organization does financially, you can pay people well. But I think it's the responsibility of the organization then, therefore, to fund itself. Like you know, you need to get the money whatever ways that God has given you so that you can take care of the people well. So that's part of the responsibility right, that uh, we, we have. And uh, of course, it's aligned to values and operating principles. That means you know, we don't uh, overpay, we don't underpay, but uh, there, there's, there are certain values that we do. And uh, a good compensation system Will keep will will not keep people worried about their money, you know. So it'll keep them focused on the goal and the goals of the organization. So if so that's also important. Now, how do you determine uh, uh, employees' staff compensation? Of course, what can you afford? What is the level of skill and competencies they bring? What is the responsibility and work they're doing? What is the leadership they're providing? Um, and uh, how are they advancing the organization's objectives? How are they growing personally? And also, you want to reward them for staying with the organization. So these are some of the things you will look at uh, when you decide. Uh, and and if, every year we 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 every year we uh, revise our staffs company their salary. So these are some of the things we look at as we. Uh, as we revise their salary, you know, so it's so, okay. Yeah, they, they're carrying more responsibility, or whatever. So these are things we look at. Uh, what are the benefits we offer? Like we mentioned earlier, there's the health insurance, the retirement savings, leaves, uh, money for learning development. There's also an annual bonus, and uh, and so on. Uh, other intangible benefits that, of course, that people get when they work for a Christian organization, they're involved in kingdom work, which brings a lot of satisfaction, uh, opportunity for missions. So we pay for all our staff to go on missions. Uh, so they have every staff has one free paid trip anywhere in India. So, uh, in fact, we've just started our missions again, trips, so people are starting to go. The church, we will pay for them, for our staff one paid trip in even India. And if they want to go on more trips, you know, they can definitely pay and go, but we will pay them for one trip. And even in India, they can go and come. Uh, you know, as long as they're doing their work well, you know, they have good job security, they can grow within the organization, we let them grow, they can move laterally, vertically, based on how they're developing. Uh, the culture, the workplace culture is a big bless, you know, it's a big positive. Uh, if you have a good organization, people feel good about working there. They like to say, no, I work for APC, I work for this you know, good organization. And then, of course, we take care of, make sure that they can balance things, uh, good work-life balance. Okay, So these are some thoughts to keep in mind when you're uh, thinking about how much to pay your staff. Right? Uh, and this is important, part of taking care of your staff. Let me pause you and see if there are any questions, any thoughts here. Okay. All right. I see a question here from Elisha. Should a Christian ministry engage in other business to maintain its finance or should depend solely on donations? Very interesting and a very good question. So, Elisha, this is my, uh, I would say, my advice based on the way we've conducted ourselves and also based on what I've observed around the world uh, with Christian ministries. As a church, as a Christian ministry, my advice or my recommendation would be never to get into any kind of business uh, operation. Right? Keep the church and the ministry purely church ministry. Um, 
And that's been the way we've operated. Now, uh, for the first 14 years or 13, 14 years, I was running both a church and a business. I kept them both separate, absolutely separate. Everything is separate. Uh, money may flow from the business to the church as a contribution, but not any other way. Money doesn't go from the church to the business, never. Yeah. So it's totally separate. And uh, uh, that was because I was involved in both. But the church itself would not engage in any kind of business activity. Now, what I've observed, and this, this was especially when I was living in the US, uh, I know of at least two cases, and there are probably more, where church got involved in business dealings, and it was terrible. It was terrible. One church, uh, um, um, the pastor joined with another person who, you know, was into this kind of uh, some sort of an investment thing. And uh, he, you know, the pastor, because you have an influence, when you say something, people will, you know, kind of blindly follow for the most part. And so that's a very dangerous thing. So the pastor got people to, you know, give money to this man who would supposedly invest their money and give them big returns. And so the pastor encouraged that people gave money to this man. This man messed it up, and it was a very painful situation, very painful. It was bad, you know. So that was one example. Uh, another example was investment in TV stations. I think. Uh, I think that another example. Uh, and this was like because many years ago I'm talking about uh, this one church that got involved in some sort of a because they were doing this TV business. I mean, not uh, they were doing TV stations, they were buying it. And again, it went through, they got into it more like a business kind of arrangement. And it was, again, very bad, you know. Uh, so, and then I, over here in India, I've heard about churches um, doing real estate business, you know. So what they would do is um, they would buy land and uh, they would sell portions of it to church members and out of that profit they would try to build their church building and so on and in many cases i've heard that that has been a cause for problems in the church and that's why you know when we began to look look at our building project the same idea came many times people were repeating hey why didn't you do this why didn't you do this i said no we will never get into any kind of business dealing even for land. The church will buy the land, the church will own the land, the church will build its building, and that's it. I want to keep it 100% clean, no business to this. Just everything belongs to the church, it's purely ministry. So that, that's my advice, because I, I just don't like the idea of that, uh, you know, getting into this business, the church ministry, getting into this business dealing will cause problems. It will then impact the ministry. It will affect the people. It will be a big mess. So my advice is stay away. There may be some successful models. Yeah, I'm not saying there's not been. For example, uh, one thing I've heard about was um, the church renting a big commercial space, uh, which on Sundays they would use for... Uh, their church services and during the week it's like a mall or whatever so they make money out of it as well so you know the church is kind of doing business and supporting the ministry whatever uh, in some cases it's worked well uh, okay you know fine but if, would I do that I wouldn't do it why because if something goes wrong it's going to impact the ministry right so there are some models where people have, okay, done something, or maybe they have separated out. I don't know exactly how it functions, but my advice is, you know, don't don't mix, don't mix church and business. Okay, Pastor, thank you very much. Um, as a follow up, um, what about a model where the ministry, uh, because it does a lot of uh, publication works it decides to set up um, a print company mm. a print company so that most of the publication works instead of taking it outsourcing it 
um, it will be done by um, a, a different entity owned by the church. So it kind of um, it's it is keeping the operation of the publishing company to within the same uh, kind of circle, and then also going into media or in a TV station, a radio station. One, those two outlets are going to serve also as a platform for the church to do its media ministry effectively. Yes. So what about that kind of model too? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. If, you know, I, I would be very careful how, how it is done. Or all these separate entities, example, the publishing, printing company, the, uh, let's say, media company. Here's how I would go about it, if I were going to do something like that. Those would be completely separate entities. They would be run by people who are, you know, professionals who are running it as a business. Uh, no money will go from the church to them other than paying for the actual service. So the church will not fund it. The church will not give seed money to it. No. Uh, it, the church would pay for the service. You know, okay, you print these books, I'll pay. Just like how they would treat any other entity. You print these books, I'll pay you the money. You do this work, I'll pay you the money. So it's just purely a paid service. It's not funding it. See, the problem is we can't take money that's given as donation and then use it as seed money to run a business that is like, you know, this. so that's, if, if we set up set it up as separate entities, it should be run as professional organizations, completely independent of the church, and the church is using their service. And it could be, of course, run by Christian people, and they should be allowed to do many businesses, whatever. Otherwise, it should be completely owned by the church. That means, like, it is part of the church. So you set up a publishing ministry, but it belongs fully to the church. It's run by the church. It's not a business. It's part of the ministry. Media team, fully run by the church. So, for example, at APC, that's how we do it, right? We have our own our own team that does the printing, everything. Of, the book. of course, we use vendors. We use a printing press. We pay them for it. We use translators, but the the books is part of the church. It's fully funded by the church. It's own. It's completely. It's part of the ministry of the church. Same thing with our media. Now we are planning to get into short films, produce short films. So that'll be hundred percent run as part of the ministry of the church. It's not a separate entity, but it's part of the church. Uh, we are setting up the Bible college. So the Bible college is part of the church, hundred percent owned and run by the church. Let's say in the future we set up a Christian school. Uh, it'll again be part of the church, 100% owned and run by the church. So it's all be part of the church. That's the way we would like to function. So it's all, everything is considered a ministry of the church. So it can be fully funded by the church. Whatever money comes in goes straight to the church. That's one way of doing it. That's the way we would do it. If you're doing it as a separate business entity, then it should be 100% separate. And those things should function as businesses. So both, both these options are there. Uh, I would choose this, or the way we are doing it is separate in the sense uh, we are doing it is that everything's owned by the church, fully funded by the church, and is a ministry of the church. That's how it's run. Uh, hope I explained myself clear, clearly, Elisha. Yes, Pastor. Yes, I'm yeah. clear. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Christopher? Ah uh, yes, but uh, I'm actually referring to uh, you know Bible reference uh, in, the, in the very early days of the church. So in Acts uh, Acts two um, verse forty four, mm -hmm. uh, I, just, I just mentioned. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all had need. So I think. Uh, in this case, they, they actually sold their possessions and then, they, you know, it was kind of distributed across or used for even for people who had, were in need mm. in that particular ministry. So I just wanted to find out, um, has this actually happened uh, I mean, in current times and, you know, 
uh, and you know, uh, I'm sure there may be challenges involved in that, but uh, has this worked? And you know, um, uh, or where is this worked? And you know, what are what are some of the uh, uh, I mean, how have they operated uh, in in case you are you know, aware of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so what we read in Acts chapter two is a special case, meaning it's a special case because it had to do with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the first eight to 10 years of the birth of the church. It's a special case because when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened, we had all, we had all these pilgrims who had left their hometowns, their home, home cities, and it all gathered, congregated in Jerusalem. Now, they, these are Jews who had come to Jerusalem in order to serve, in order to participate in that 50 day period of feasts. It was a Passover, the feast of the um, uh, first fruits, and then there was the feast of Pentecost spread over these 50 days. So they had left everything, they'd come in, and then they were impacted by the Holy Spirit. The point of the Holy Spirit, they became believers. They continued to stay on. So obviously they didn't have the resources. And in that context, believers helped each other. But this was only that early period of the church. You don't find this as a practice in all the other church plants going on. In fact, what you do find in the writings of the Apostle Paul later on in Ephesians chapter 4, in uh, um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he basically says, you know, let each one, Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, let each one work with their own hands, uh, provide for their own needs, uh, provide for their own family, and so on. So you see a change in how the life of the church continued later on, as you read in the episodes, compared to what happened in Acts chapter 2. So that's why we say Acts chapter 2 was a unique situation, and in order to meet the needs of that situation, this is what they did. Now, in contemporary society, I have read, I never personally witnessed, but I've read of uh, a certain very well-known Christian author. Uh, I think his name is, I don't know, I, I don't want to mention his name, but anyway. So he was a big proponent of this idea, and he tried to create Christian communities like this. He tried to replicate Acts chapter 2 in modern times. The result was disastrous because uh, in modern times, uh, family units um, have their own needs. You know, you, you have to send your children to school, this, that, no, you know. And then if you start to create, and, and each one has their own homes, et cetera, et cetera, all that. And now you try to create some sort of a community pool of money to take care of all of these people. It it actually resulted in a lot of abuse from the reports I read about an attempt to replicate Acts 2 in modern times. So, um, you know, so, and we have to know that it's not a biblical thing. The biblical thing, as you read on in the episodes, is that there is a difference where everyone is instructed to work and take care of their families and so on. So uh, that's, yeah. That's that's what I would say. Yeah. So just so just as follow up, uh, I mean, and related to that uh, discussion we had on uh, the interim interim uh, um, ministry. Um, at the end of the Bible, you know, there's this mention about you know, uh, even Jesus, you know, you know, sending out his um, his uh, disciples out, and uh, he told them to you know to go, uh, and you know. Not even have you know an extra pair of clothes and uh, um, I know I uh, mm. go very simply go to different towns and uh, so again I would say that that would be would that be in this sort of exceptional kind of case or would this be uh, you know I mean how would you kind of view it you know going in going as more in a, in a simpler yeah approach and um, having uh, uh, a ministry or a, or a church you know. In, in a sense, kind of sponsor that person um, in in a simple way, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. how, how would that? I mean, is that is that has that worked in, in contemporary uh, in, in mm -hmm. contemporary sort of uh, era? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so uh, when you look at the Gospels, you see Jesus also make a change. 
So in Matthew 10, when he gave the commission to the 12, he said, when you go, don't take anything with you. Don't worry about anything. Into whichever city you enter, you just go there. Whoever receives you, let your peace be on the house. You will eat with them and more. But towards the end of his ministry, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Luke chapter 22, verses 35 and 36, Luke 22, 35 and 36, Jesus changes that. He says, you know, uh, Luke 22, 35 and 36 says, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack, sandals, did you lack anything? So they said nothing. Then he said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. This is Luke 22, 35 and 36. So you find that Jesus actually reversed it. In Matthew 10, he said, don't take anything. Luke 22, he says, take your money back, take your clothes, take your sword with you. Right. So uh, the, the reason I'm highlighting it is, you know, Jesus himself reversed what he had changed. He had changed. Okay. For you, you've done this now. From now on, let's do it differently. To answer your question, you know, each one of us has to live the way God has called us to live. There are people who would live, let's say, according like Matthew 10 says, if they don't worry about anything, they just go and they just live. And, uh, and, 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 and if God has called them to do that, you know, God will take care of them. Uh, but for the others, we have to live by the other side of scripture where God tells us to be responsible. You know, you, 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 you work, you take care of your needs, etc. So uh, my answer to that question would be, you know, each one has to do what God's called them to do. For most of us, we just have to follow the instruction of scripture, which is, you know, be responsible, work, take care of your family, this, that, those things. Then maybe those who God says, you know, hey, I just want you to live like this. Don't worry, just go. Okay, they have to obey God. And so that would be the uh, the right way to live. Just follow, you know, the, be clear about what God calls each one of us to. If there is no clear word, then just follow the instruction of Scripture, which is be responsible and, you know, do what you have to do. Sri Kumar, you have a question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, I have two questions. Um, First, the follow-up question from uh, which which Alicia has asked. So, I just want I need a little clarification. If I keep my business away from my ministry, and if I do, and um, not uh, involving the the money of the ministry into the business, but rather than my whole idea is um, you know using the money of my business into the ministry, mm. is that wrong or um, is that the right right step I, I take? Mm. That is fine. That is fine. If money is going from business to ministry, that is fine. Okay, that there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, you're keeping everything separate. Yes, sir. but uh, money is going into that is a good thing. That's Thank not. You, a, that's not a good problem. Thank you, sir. Sir, my second question is um, uh, regarding to employee compensation and benefit. I just want to know uh, this one thing uh, that, um, uh, like as you said, you evaluate the performance. So now in the corporate world, you evaluate the performance based on their targets and their achievements. So in their in the spiritual uh, thing, how we can how uh, what how can you evaluate the things? And second thing, I also saw like some churches where they have they keep the targets like you no, know, this number of uh, baptism, this number of baptism should be to the people are just uh, forcing the people to get into baptism mm, mm. so is it like that uh, or um, how we how we come to know that uh, you no know, if you are uh, actually giving a hike to a particular pastor or an employee so how do you evaluate his performance every year so i just want to know that thank you master mm. good good question yeah so how do we evaluate and so um I, i've shared a little bit on um, this let's give you a minute i can so uh, it's a very good question. The way we do it at APC, we don't uh, do it based on targets. Like, you know, <laughs> uh, it's not like a uh, number of baptisms or uh, those kinds of things. We don't do that. Uh, let's see now if I can quickly show you. 
Um, so uh, we look at basically their role. Uh, so it, 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 of course, varies based on their role and how they have contributed to the organization and to the growth of the organization. So it, it is quite subjective, right, in the sense that it's very specific to each, sorry, each person. And uh, it's not based on uh, numbers, uh, uh, although in some cases, for example, let me see if yeah. Um, okay, I was trying to bring that up. Yeah, uh, although in some cases, you know, numbers do uh, not in terms of targets, but more in terms of okay, you know, has the church grown? Uh, or, for example, um, uh, our, uh, our, our worship team, you know, did you produce, did you release music, you know, these, did you write and release songs that year? So that would be important because, you know, we, we keep motivating our, or we keep encouraging our, uh, our, uh, Worship to me. You know, you need to write songs. So basically, the worship pastor is responsible to make sure that they train the people. They um, they uh, uh, keep you know building up the team so that the team can then write songs and then we produce the songs and so on. So we uh, we we try to do that. You know, we try to. Uh, look at it. So let me just take a moment quickly to share um, some of the things we look at. Just give me a minute. Uh, okay. So uh, here's how, what do we look at, right? So overall performance, right? So overall performance, of course, how did this person, so example, a worship pastor, you know, we will look at and how, how 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 did he do as a worship pastor in that previous year or in the year that's just getting over? So you know, did he did the worship team was the worship team develop? Are new people brought into the team? Did the worship team go up to a good level? Did he you know invest in um, training the people? Right. Then looking at his intra people interactions, work ethics, values, you know, creativity. Did he come up with something new this year? You know, did they do something different? Did they come up with some new ideas? Uh, or what about the quality of their work? I mean, is he showing really passion and hard work? Uh, is he developing himself or he or she growing? Are they growing in the areas? Are they contributing to the organization? So they're not just focused on their own work, but they're also contributing to organization. Are they carrying, what are the leadership and response that they're carrying? Are they solving problems for the church, the people, the congregation? So all of these are subjective, so they're not numeric. They are not um, in numbers. They are more on the quality of their work and the quality of their leadership. So this is how we look at uh, people and based on these things, and this is in our staff document. So based on these things, uh, we would, uh, you know, uh, we would score them here, and we, with a, you know, of course, they will score themselves. The, if they're reporting to somebody, the team leader will score. Somebody else will score. And the pastors also score, and you look at their overall average. So uh, that's how we do it. So it's not purely numbers. It's more of a quality of their work in these areas uh, that we assess. So it is very subjective. So it is based on observation, based on actual work that is done that you could see. But um, uh, we are having conversations with people throughout the year that says, look, we're looking at it. Example, our worship team, I tell them, see, every year you have to produce six, at least six new songs. So I've given a number, six, because it's a practical thing that they can work at. Now, the last two years, we didn't do that. Um, last year, we released only two new songs, I think. Year before that, maybe two, two songs and so on. Um, uh, so, you know, um, the, the uh, and okay, yeah, you know, it was a pandemic and, you know, a lot of constraints were there. So although our goal is at least six new songs, okay, we did two, five, Okay, so uh, they were not penalized for 
not bringing out six new songs, you know. But that we have a number. The number is more of a guideline, right? Because it's a doable thing, and it says okay. But then they have to work on it throughout the year to be able to produce six new songs. But my goal is, I say, hey, as many songs as you can release it. You know, uh, that's the overall encouragement because we want our worship team to be writing songs and producing them and releasing. So the overall guidelines is as many songs as you can do it, but at least eight for six, then it is more a practical thing. So like, that's how we do it. But it's not like, we, it's not numbers driven. It's more of a qualitative thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Roshan, I will post uh, this in the uh, class work section as well. Yeah. I'll do that. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. OK. All right, so uh, we will pause here for today. I think uh, we'll have a lot to cover uh, when we talk about staff management. Um, uh, having Managing people well is very important for the Christian organization uh, because ultimately it's the people who are going to be doing the ministry, you know. Uh, it's not just one pastor. One pastor cannot do it. No. Uh, it's all of us together, working together, you know, that uh, uh, are going to eventually produce the work of the ministry. So that's why people are very important and taking care of them, uh, paying them well, uh, and uh, helping them grow. All these things are very important. We'll continue this next week. We will pause here. Can somebody pray and dismiss us, please? Can I pray, Pastor? Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Heavenly Father, once again, we come to you with a lot of gratitude in our hearts. We thank you for the opportunity you have granted us to learn through our interactions. We pray that you grant us the grace to be effective and efficient leaders in our ministries. Father, we pray that you continue to guide our decisions and our thoughts as some of us prepare to step into full-time ministry. Lord, we pray that you continue to grant Pastor Ashes the wisdom and the understanding so that whenever we engage him, he will be able to pour into our lives. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. See you again soon. God bless you all. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. God bless. Have a good weekend.